I'm Noah Albaum and I coordinate programs for the Jewish Community Library, which is a program of Jewish learning works. I want to welcome you to tonight's presentation on Torn Lilacs with Henry Mikalski. All of our programming is made possible by the Friends of the Jewish Community Library, and I hope you'll consider supporting our programming by becoming a friend of the library. During the first part of the program, everyone will be muted, um, or at least that's our intention for everyone to be muted, um, except for our presenter. There will be time for questions in the second half of the program. You can type your questions into the chat or send them to me directly at any point during the program. Henry Mikulski was born in Kazakhstan on August 3rd, 1945, between VE Day in Europe and the bombing of Hiroshima. He lived for two years in a displaced persons camp in Bavaria until the US agreed to take in a limited number of refugees. He arrived at Ellis Island with his family, his parents and brother in 1949, and they settled eventually in San Francisco. Henry graduated from San Francisco State University and taught history in the Napa schools in addition to raising a family, traveling, writing, and moderating TV and radio programs in Napa, and finally writing this book, Torn Lilacs. Thank you, Henry, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Noah, for that introduction. And thank you, Howard Friedman from the Jewish Library in San Francisco. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to all of you for coming out this night in your homes. I see Mimi's here. Hi, Mimi. It's been a long time. And I see Laura and John and, and uh, Prentice is here. Uh, wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I see Max Schleicher. I haven't seen you in a long time, Max. Wonderful. This is like a homecoming. Um, like Noah said, I was born in Kazakhstan between VE Day and VJ Day. Uh, when I was still nursing, my parents uh, somehow made it back to Europe on a train. It took a long time. They needed to go back to Poland. They needed to have closure. They wanted to go to their small town. Uh, when we got to Europe, of course, the revelation, the enormity of the Holocaust was revealed to them. And uh, uh, going back to Poland was just not an option. Poland was not receptive, and there was no reason to go back there. The entire Jewish population had vanished, ceased to exist. Uh, the Allies had set up uh, DP camps, displaced persons camps. Uh, ironically enough, we were in Germany, uh, the place that uh, perpetrated all this hatred and uh, turmoil against the Jewish population. But we were there for a couple of years in a place called Traunstein, the Lage, the camp. And I have vivid memories of all that. Uh, when you read the book, you'll see that uh, I am the miracle child <laughs> twice over, not just my birth in Kazakhstan, but some of the events that happened in the DP camp. On a wonderful day in the camp, and I can remember this very distinctly, I was four years old. My father came home from work one day, and he put me up on the table. He called over my older brother, Jerry, Yurik. And he said in Yiddish, Morgen at Magaina for Grace Schiffs America. I didn't know the whole meaning of it, but America had a resonance to it. Uh, it was a very special place. It was like saying tomorrow we're going to the Garden of Eden, going to heaven, some very special place. And Jerry started jumping up and down. So I started jumping up and down. We were thrilled. Uh, sure enough, we got on the boat. It was called the General Muir. It was an American destroyer. Um, the boat ride was uh, extraordinary for two weeks. A small boy, you can imagine, being on a boat where my mother indoctrinated us and said, we are privileged to come to America. We're going to be good citizens. We're going to obey the laws. We are incredibly lucky to have been allowed to come into this wonderful nation. And I still love America to this day with all my heart, and I'll protect her with all my might. Uh, we came to New York first. We had a sponsor there, and New York was very difficult for my parents, as you can imagine. We didn't have a language. Uh, my father was a sheet metal worker back in Poland, and he tried to get a job, couldn't. Uh, he's on the metric system. Uh, we lived in a four-story walk-up cold water tenement in Brooklyn. For a view, we had chimneys, and for uh, a backyard, we had broken glass to play in. We didn't even have a bathroom. We my brother and I got our baths in the kitchen sink. And my mother, the feeder in the family, she was really the ruler of the family. She said, you know what? 
it's hotter in hell here in, in the summer and it's freezing in the winter. Let's go to California. It never rains in California. It's beautiful. They had some mishpucha back in San Francisco. So in 1950, we hopped on a train after going to Madison Square Garden where we lost Jerry. That's a whole different story. Great story. We lost Jerry at Madison Square Garden. That was our farewell to New York. Uh, three days on a train, we come to San Francisco. We end up on Ellis Street of all places, 1730 Ellis Street, just a block away from the library, the Jewish library. That area is no longer in existence, of course. It's now just a park. It's been leveled. But we lived there, and that area, the Fillmore District of San Francisco, was really a hub of uh, what we call the Green Ahayas, the newcomers, the green animals, the very aggressive people. They were going to make it in America, and they all congregated in that Fillmore area. We lived on Ellis Street, but on Shabbos, we'd walk down Fillmore to McAllister Street. And on McAllister, you heard Yiddish for five blocks straight. There was the the Ukraine bakery, there was a little synagogue on Webster Street, there was all the delicatessens, and later all the junk shops would open up, um, and they, the junk shops eventually became antique shops, and the, uh, and the Jews became very, uh, they became prosperous. Uh, growing up, though, it was very interesting growing up in San Francisco, uh, because I wasn't sure who I was. As you can see, I'm a little darker, I'm Ashkenazi, on one side, and kids at school would always ask me, who are you? You know, where are you from? And I, I uh, what's your nationality? And I never knew what to say. I said, I, I, am I Kazakhstani since I was born there? I didn't feel Kazakhstani. I didn't know anything about it. Am I Russian since Kazakhstan was in Soviet Union? No. Am I Polish because my parents are Polish? I didn't feel Polish. Uh, am I American? Well, I, I would like to be an American, but what's an American? Am I that? Are we that yet? <laughs> uh, what about Jewish? Is that a religion? Is that a, an ethnic background? I didn't know what I was. Uh, and also, we missed out on a lot of things, like having a grandma or grandpa, the warm embrace of, can you imagine a grandfather showing you little tricks or teaching you a language or an instrument or something? We didn't have that. Uh, for Christmas, the family would get in the car and we'd go down to the marina and drive very slowly and look into the windows of people enjoying each other's company and Christmas trees and opening presents. And vicariously, we kind of had that sort of upbringing. But mostly, what I wanted to talk about are the stories, how this book came about. As a child, uh, the survivors would come to my parents' house. We all clung together out of necessity. We all clung together. And I was four or five years old, six years old maybe, and I was very quiet off to the corner and I would listen to their stories. And I would hear horrendous stories that no five-year-old child should hear. I heard new words were coming into my, into my uh, consciousness. I, words like Siberia, Kazakhstan, gangrene, amputations, Nazis, refugees, survivor, all these words were coming in and, and I was very confused and I would hear horrible stories of what they went through. One guy I'll never forget had numbers tattooed to his arm, but he was so ashamed of those numbers that he had them stylized into an American eagle, or at least he thought it looked like an eagle. To me, it looked like, you know, black ink gone astray. It was just ugly. It was a big smudge, but I saw those numbers and I was wondering, what did that person go through? And I heard these stories, and, and as I grew up, I wanted to know more. My mother uh, uh, is the one that designated me the historian in the family. She said, Henry, you're going to write the story. I want the story out. The world has to know. Everybody knows about Auschwitz and what the Jews went through in Europe. But what happened in Siberia and what happened in Kazakhstan and especially, I, I'm astounded when I think of that uh, raft trip they were on. For two weeks, they were on a raft in Siberia. Uh, these amazing stories of amputation and stuff. And my mother said, Henry, you're going to write this story. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to tell you the story. You are the historian. You're going to do this thing. And for about 40 years, I uh, struggled with this. In my mind, I said, I, I knew I had the story. It was handed to me. I know my name is on the book, right? But it's really not my story. It's their story. They gave it to me. Uh, I, I knew I had a tremendous story. I just prayed to God 
that he or she would guide my hand so that I could tell the story properly, so that the world could learn what my parents went through, so that nobody else should have to go through this at any time. Nobody should have to go through what they went through. Um, so I sat down with, a, I came with, a, in 1976 it started, I took uh, my friend uh, Harris Nussbaum with me. We did a tape recorder. And I, uh, it was a mistake, actually, because my parents interrupted each other. They talked over each other. They corrected one another. So I went back many, many times with recorders and tapes and this and that. And I pretty well have the story. Um, and like I said, it's, it's really astounding. And I'm gratified by the response that this story has generated among the public. I never knew how the story would resonate with people. Uh, but it's really hit a vital chord. It's, uh, it's, it's a story that, like my mom said, really has to be told, especially now with all the uncertainty in the world, with the resurgence of anti-Semitism in the world, with Rohingya, I heard a story on NPR today, other ethnic groups going through hor horrific things only because of their ethnicity. This should never happen to anyone again, ever. For any reason. With your permission, if you're up for it, I'd like to read a few sections of the book. Uh, I selected three sections. Uh, my mother is the hero in one, my father, neutral. Uh, and this will give you a sort of a taste of what Torn Lilacs is all about, this book right here. Uh, let me set the scene for you, okay? I'm going to read from chapter five, where my mom and her brother are leaving home. They had to go. Signs went up all over Gustinine, their little town, that everyone, all men ages 15 to 50, have to report to the train station. In three days, they're taking everybody to concentration camps. Life was so hard, and uh, they had to wear yellow badges. You couldn't get food, petrol. Everything was, uh, it was terrible. Things were horrible. Uh, as fate had it, a cousin came to their little town so that her, his daughter could have an operation on her head. She had a tumor on her brain, which everyone thought was caused because she stood outside in the cold waiting for bread. And she, everybody thought that caused the tumor. She came to the town of Gustinine to have the operation. Gustinine had a hospital. Their little town didn't have one. A meeting was held that night at the Couvent house. <clears throat> it said, Fella and Kuba are going to go with the uncle. He's going to take him in the wagon out of Gustinine, and they're going to try to get all the way across the River Bug, about 400 kilometers to the east. They're going to try to go to the Soviet sector of Poland. Poland was divided between Russia and Germany in the non-aggression pact. They needed to cross the river to get on the other side. They wanted to go to Ukraine, to a place called Olesko, where my father was. My mom and my dad were not married yet. They were betrothed. He wrote a letter, said, I'm captured by the Russians. I'm in Olesko, near in Ukraine, near Lvov. Come, I will save you. I will be with you. I'll take care of you. So this is uh, the chapter where my mom and her brother Kuba are leaving home. Okay? It was snowing on the, mon on the morning of Wednesday, January the 10th, 1940. Five days later would be Golda High's 42nd and Kuba's 22nd birthdays, but no one gave those a thought. Tata was up earlier than usual, looking like an old rabbi wrapped in his talit and tefillin and swaying to a mumbled prayer he hoped the master of the universe would hear. Tefella, her father appeared more distinguished and thoughtful than she had ever seen him before, like a learned old tzaddik, a righteous soul. When he concluded his prayers, he called his son and daughter over to the window, placed his arms around them, and gave them each a special blessing. He begged God to look after his children and see that they remained safe and strong. With tears in his eyes, he tenderly kissed Fel and Kuba on the forehead and placed his hands on their heads. He recited the ancient priestly benediction, Aaron's blessing for his sons from the Book of Numbers. May God bless you and keep you. May God cause the divine light to shine upon you and be generous to you. May God turn toward you and may God grant you peace. Amen. 
Tata kissed his children on the forehead for the second time and walked with them to the door. He waved thanks to Uncle Meyer and Malka, who was out in the courtyard making final preparations for the trip, eager to get moving. The wooden flatbed wagon was piled high with hay up to the side railings. Fella hugged Nepshu, a tearful goodbye. The old dog sniffed the outside air and turned back to her warm spot on the floor near the stove. The sun was hidden that morning, obscured by the heavy snow coming down in horizontal sheets as Fella and Kuba quietly stepped outside into the storm. They purposefully kissed the mezuzah, which was nailed to the doorpost, then tossed their heavy canvas rucksacks into the wagon, which was loaded and ready for the journey. <clears throat> the siblings climbed in and looked around intently, thinking it might be the last time they would see their family and their familiar surroundings. They waved a solemn goodbye. Then they lay down in the back of the wagon and Uncle Meyer quickly, quickly shielded them with a heavy tarpaulin. He followed by covering the tarp with straw until they were entirely concealed, like something Fella had once seen in an American film. Uncle Meyer said, keep low, try not to move, stay warm and be quiet. Malka looked pretty in her triangularly folded babushka, which she tied in a knot under her chin. She sat huddled on the driver's bench in the front of the wagon, along with her father, huddled up against the icy gusts. Mama and Mashka wrapped against the elements, followed the wagon down the road a bit, waving with one hand, wiping away tears with the other, until it faded from sight. The pain of saying goodbye to her two oldest children was unbearable for Golda High, who practically collapsed from heartache. As the wagon headed into the blizzard, Mama and Mashka, who held her mother tightly, slowly walked home in the freezing cold. The heavy snow piling up on the road added to their dismal outlook. Mama said, we must always give thanks to God. But today, Mashkala, I don't know what to thank him for. Our world is falling apart, and tomorrow Tata leaves for the camps. You're such a sweet girl. On the main road just outside of Gustinine, the wagon was stopped at a German checkpoint. Fella and Kuba held their breaths. Their hearts were pounding. The soldiers were barking out curt orders, and Uncle Meyer shouting back answers at the guards manning their station. As luck had it, the storm was in full force and the guards were in no mood to search the wagon. They allowed it to pass without inspection or incident. As it proceeded along the road, Kuba whispered to Fella, I held my breath the whole time. I was so scared. I held my breath the whole time too. And this is only the beginning. Well, at least there's one good thing about this freezing weather. It may have just saved our lives. That's in the middle of a chapter, but I just wanted to read those two pages for you, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, the journey that they were about on. This is only on page uh, 64. We've got a 200 more pages. And I guarantee you, my friends, every single chapter, there's 54 chapters in this book. Every single chapter has a harrowing story to tell, Something amazing happens, a miracle happens, something. I should have titled this book, A Book of Miracles, because it really was a miracle that they survived, that anyone survived the Nazis who were intent on genocide. Would you like to hear another session? You have no choice. I'm gonna do <laughs> I see a few people nodding. Okay, we'll do it. Um, I'd like to read to you uh, a few chapters later they were caught by the uh, Nazis and they're being marched into the forest. The soldiers have a, a dog on a leash. They've got rifles pointed at these poor Jewish people that are being taken out to the forest and they've got shovels in their hands. It's pretty obvious what's going to happen to them. Okay. They're being marched out to the forest where they're all going to be shot. I'll read it to you. They slugged along the icy road, piled high at the sides with snow, and approached the woods. The Nazis were negotiating with their dispirited prisoners, promising them freedom in exchange for various items. 
the young prisoners sensed something sinister. Out of desperation, they offered jewelry, money they had hidden, anything in exchange for their freedom. Lugging their heavy canvas rucksacks, which contained everything they owned, Fella and her brother fell further behind. She noticed a mother with two children shamelessly groveling before the Nazis, offering up her diamond wedding band, begging and weeping. Fella said to her brother, you know what, Kuba? Listen, if they come to us, we'll say we don't have a thing, nothing. Once you start negotiating with them, they'll take everything and they'll shoot you anyway. We'll say we have nothing. Kuba nodded in agreement. His leather shoes were soaked from the wet mud. Walking became a chore. As they tramped along the slushy road towards the dense woodland, Fella sensed an opportunity. At the rear of at the at the rear of the doomed procession, she whispered to her brother, "You know what? They're so busy dealing, they're not even paying attention. We'll make a run. Take my hand." Kuba, Kuba grimaced at the thought of running in the snow, but knew his sister was right. Escaping was their only hope. He took her hand. They showed they slowed their pace even more, lagging further behind, waiting for the perfect moment when suddenly Fella jerked Kuba's hand, causing the two of them to veer off the road and over a snowy embankment. In a flash, they were out of sight. Without hesitation, they slid on their behinds down a sleep grade for several meters into a ravine, stopped for a quick breath and kept plodding on until they were well aware from the, away from the road. They had managed to elude their captors and certain death. Fella, who knew the guards would discover their absence and come looking for them, encouraged her brother to continue on. They got up and trudged into the dense grove of trees, mostly fir and Polish larch, standing like winter sculptures heavily laden with snow. With no time to admire nature's beauty, fear and adrenaline pushed them on, but Kuba could hardly keep up. His feet burned with pain and numbness was setting in. It took everything he had not to scream out. Fella grabbed Kuba's pack, took him by the arm and encouraged him to muster all of his strength to keep walking. Please, Fella, Kuba, look. I know it's hard for you, but you gotta keep moving. A faint sun in the gray overcast sky was low to the ground and soon it would be dark. The siblings paused for a moment to catch their breaths. Off in the distance, the faint bark of a dog broke the silence, sending a shiver of fear down their spines. The sound became clearer, causing the runaways to quicken their gait and push further and deeper into the woods. In the darkening forest, the brother and sister, exhausted, tripped and fell, got up, managed a few more steps. They stumbled like drunks in the thick powder, but continued pushing onward. Now they could clearly hear the dog yapping and the muted shouts of a man, probably a soldier, echoing in the doom of the forest. Out of sheer terror, the two struggled to move forward with every ounce of energy remaining in their weary bodies. Kuba winced with every step, Fella fell, snapping a branch. She froze, petrified that the dog would hear the sound. The canine was getting closer and its bark had become a threatening growl that sounded more ominous by the second. <clears throat> the pair darted into a large hollow spot under a fallen tree, deep in the snow, hoping to catch a breath. In their snowy hiding place, they instinctively held each other tightly. As they began to warm up, they calmly reassured each other and prayed the dog would miss their scent. It was all they could do. Ter terrified of the ferocious animal, the fellow whispered into Kuba's ear, Oi, that dog is going to eat us up alive. Did we come all this way just for him to tear us apart? They were holding on to each other with all their strength, shaking with fear. The fellow whispered, Kuba, I can feel your heart beating. Through all these clothes, I can feel your heart. Can you feel mine? He held her closely. Yes, he whispered. I can feel your heart too. He held his sister tightly, as tight as he was able to. Their hearts beating wildly as one. The dog snarled nearby. The fellow whispered, this could be it. Oh, Ikubula, pray, let's pray the dog misses us. Suddenly, fellow glimpsed 
20 meters away, a soldier restraining a German shepherd on a chain leash and approaching in their direction. The dog's snout worked the ground intensely. The escapees froze, breathing as one, their hands covering their steamy breath. Fella could hear her brother softly mumming, mumbling the words of the sacred Shema, his lips quivering. Every second felt like a lifespan. Unexpectedly, the canine's baying grew fainter and more muted. The hound had apparently missed his human prey. After a few minutes, Kuba said softly, thank you, God, thank you. His breathing became more relaxed and audibly exhaled with great relief. The dog's barking grew fainter still. Do you see, he said, were it not for God's miracles, we should have perished long ago. Fella responded, the rabbis teach that the fate of all time depends upon a single moment. This was our moment. We were the lucky ones. It was quiet, dark, and cold in the forest, and the siblings were utterly lost and alone, but they were alive. They remained in their secluded spot for a few more minutes, practically frozen together, but breathing easier, make, taking stock of their situation. They were weary, hungry, stiff, thirsty, shivering. The solitude of the moment was abruptly interrupted by a volley of staccato rifle fire off in the distance. It reverberated throughout the woods, and in a few seconds, it was over. Quiet returned, like after a scream, except for the rustling of a nearby snow finch. Softly, Kuba said to Fella, the fate of all time. The eerie howl of a lone wolf, or more likely a German shepherd, could be heard off in the distance. That's the end of that chapter. They survived that. Uh, and they say to each other later, how much, how much drama can a human being take? Most people just gave up. They were caught, I, I lost count, maybe six, seven times they were caught by the Nazis. People all around them died. They were hauled away. And for some reason, they survived. Now, you notice my uncle Kuba with his legs. Remember, he was going numb. I can tell you that a few chapters from next to this, the next few chapters are entitled, Your Feet Will Save You. He actually had all of his toes amputated much later with a uh, tin snips. They sterilized some tin snips and one at a time with no anesthesia. He just bit down on his blanket, which was tattered. It was just uh, to shreds. He just shredded that poor blanket, just chewed it up. Uh, but he knew that uh, he had to survive and he had to get well and teach himself to walk again. And that's just the surface of what this story is all about. I just read you a couple sections. I can read another if you like, but uh, I don't know. Do you have a, I, I'd like to, Take a question or two if you have any at this point. If anybody would like to ask a question. I must have answered everything. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, Laura, do you want to ask something? I can't hear you. If anybody, uh, otherwise I could read. What would you like to do, Noah? Um, someone has a question, so I'm going to unmute them. OK. Uh, Laura, did you or Laura? Uh, Dad, can can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. All right. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Miss Henry, uh, my parents knew your parents. Your mother was Fanny Mikalski yeah. in my house. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my father <laughs> was uh, it was a Shanghai lander. He got to the Richmond district through Shanghai. Yeah. And uh, so we, I think I played with your younger brother. I'm not sure. But uh, Georgie, do you have yeah. a brother named Georgie? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, of course, my father had a much easier time, clearly, than your parents did. And, uh, you know, Shanghai, yeah, you know, they say it, it was like a resort compared to what your parents went through. But what was and, but what I, the thing that occurs to me is we, 
this is all out in the open now, but, uh, but in the 50s in the Richmond dis district, you know, my father was traumatized. They didn't, he, I, he didn't want me as a kid knowing about this. So when your mother got you involved, you must've been a bit, a little older, right? The kids were not to know about this. They almost tried to hit it and hide it. And they weren't consciously trying to hide it. They were traumatized. And uh, I, I know I, I can sort of remember my father when, when, when Fanny Mikalski would be mentioned, he'd go, oh, yeah, no, you know, he knew that she had suffered and all that stuff. So I, I just want to remark that you the know, 50s and the early, maybe. Thank you, Leonard. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. You know, most people who have experienced combat or this kind of suffering don't talk about it. Uh, my father certainly didn't. He was stoic. He was a workaholic. He buried himself in work. And his favorite expression was, shlugas arose from the cup. If you have a problem, you don't go to a shrink. You don't take drugs. You don't uh, you know, go to a therapist. You shluga, you beat it out of your head. You just beat it out and you move on with your life. And that's what he did. He didn't talk about it. He just worked. And Now, my mom, on the other hand, she knew she had a story. And she impressed that upon us. When we were small, she showed us her legs with all the gangrene marks, 15 holes. And she wanted that story out. She told us the story. She said, I want the world to know my story. I want them to know that my suffering was not for no, for no reason. So we bring not only a blessing to their memory, but that their memory should serve a purpose that no one else. That, that's why this book is like a wake-up call. It's happening all over again. And... And so it, it's really important that these stories get out there and that good people do something when they see evil in this world. And there's plenty of it. Henry, I'm, and, I'm wondering. And, and I feel that God allowed me to write this book. I really am. Thank you. Sorry. I'm, I'm wondering what it was like um, for you and your mother in you know, as she was telling you the story, like the like interview process, so so to speak, what was what that was like for each of you? I'm sorry. What, what's the question? What, what was it? Say it again, please. What was it like for you and or your mother when, as she was telling you the story, was it something that you, you know, you sat down in sessions that she told you about, or was it just something that you absorbed over a long period of time? Well, as a child, I heard stories, and over time, I heard incidences. I heard the dog story. I heard about the gangrene, my uncle getting his toes. I heard all this. But in 76, I started piecing it all together chronologically. I started hearing all the stories. There was a couple times when my father asked me to turn off the tape because he wanted to tell me about my birth, which I don't think I'm revealing too much, but I was actually a twin, and uh, they had to make an abortion. And uh, they, uh, they, uh, this was in Kazakhstan, in Jambul, and they got my mate. Um, I think it's why I was born with one kidney, but uh, the person that uh, performed this operation on my mother said that we got one for sure. She said, I'm not sure if, the other, if I got the other one, but if he lives, he's going to be a miracle child with a purpose. <laughs> and a guardian angel and um i don't like to talk about that too much it's very personal private i'm sharing with you but i uh, take that very seriously and i thank god every day for every day that i'm alive because it is very special i shouldn't be here and when you read what happened to me in the uh, dp camp uh it kind of reinforces that idea <laughs> yeah this is uh, this is a, a miracle all of us all of you are a miracle also every one of you you know if you're jewish you know your parents came or your your grandparents came somebody like uh leonard you know the we all have stories to tell all of us that's the beauty of this country america took us in we were so you know my father was going to go to we were going to go to palestine he had his box all packed with his tools and his clothes he had everything for palestine but he knew it was going to be harsh. He knew the Arabs would not allow a Jewish state to rise in their midst, and there would be a war. And he had two small kids. And in the last minute, the United States let us in. He gave that entire box to Uncle Kuba, because Kuba went to Palestine with his wife, Tova. And my father said, you're going to need that box. Where you're going, 
you're going to need those tools and that clothes and everything. And you're going to, you're going to fight your way to statehood. Uh, and we came on a boat to America. And my father, uh, they were so inspired. You know, that first generation, I was telling Howard before, that first generation, they came here. Uh, we came in 1949. Think about this, my friends. We came to the United States in 1949. By 1952, three years later, they bought a house in San Francisco. Okay? Incredible. I mean, un incredible. My mother saved every single penny. We didn't get new clothes. We didn't go to restaurants. We didn't have vacations or even a car. Uh, but she squeezed every single penny and she made it happen. She said, I'm having a house for my kids. are going to have their own home and they're going to look nice. They're going to have press clothes and they're going to be a somebody. That's what my mother said. <laughs> she said, uh, it's nice you're a school teacher, but write this book. Then you're going to be a somebody and you get to talk to the Jewish library in San Francisco. <laughs> so uh, I'm thrilled that my old age, uh, finally, this book has arrived. This story had to be told. I did the very best job I possibly could. It's been well received and I'm thrilled with how it's going. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight with all of you. If there are any more questions, I'd be delighted to try to answer them. I just wanted to uh, comment more? Than, Hi. more of a comment than a question, but um, uh, what what you know you you speak a lot about miracles, and she spoke about miracles. But what really impressed me throughout the book was your mother's strength of character. Um, like, how did she know to have the presence of mind to run when she could run at the train station? You know, when the Nazis ended yeah. up taking all the Jews yeah. to say. You know, this moment, grab this, seize this moment and, and get away. Um, but even more right. so when she was in the, um, the, the Siberian labor camp. And you know, I, I kept thinking, here's a, a Polish girl from a small village in Poland. How did she know they sent her to, to fell trees with who knows what equipment? How does she know how to fell trees? And then when the Soviets finally let them go, she lashes these logs together to build a raft that carries, you know, what, 24, 36 people, uh, I don't know how many it 40 was. 40 people, 40. Yeah. 40 people, uh, you know, down the river to Kazakhstan. Um, it's just incredible to me um, that she had so much, just, you know, so much grit and, and determination. And yet, just as the last part of my comment is, despite all of that strength, you show a moment when she was so vulnerable, which was when her former comrade from the labor camp, a Polish woman who was not Jewish, uh, once they were out of the labor camp, she rejects her, she turns her face away from them and says, I, who are you? I don't know you. Uh, in other words, the old Polish anti-Semitism resurfacing once they were no longer allies against the Russians. And she's just broken. Right, right. She's just so heartbroken. And, and that to see that side of her was really, really moving to me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying that. At the end of the day, like Kuba said in the book, you're just a Jew. At the end of the day, that's all you are. You're mm -hmm. just a Jew. Thank you for saying that, Laura. Mm. You know, um, I just wanted to say also that yeah. I've been reading this book a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, you go to bed, you want to read a good book, right? So I pick up Torn Lilacs. Uh, but I go to a different a little reading. I go to a different, you know, Victor Hugo once said, if I want to read a good book, I'll just write one. But um, I, I just pick another chapter at random. I, I just pick any chapter in the book and I just read it vicariously as if I'm Jackie or somebody reading it for the first time. And all of a sudden, and I don't mind saying this to this group tonight, all of a sudden, I just burst out crying. I'm just crying. I, I, not prepared. I can't help it. And I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, what these people went through, what my parents, these are my parents I'm writing about, what they went through. And then I think what my people have gone through forever. And then I'm thinking, and God gave me the strength to write this book. How incredible is that? And the book is out there, and it's it's made a statement. My parents' life now has meaning. They didn't just live and suffer and have pain and die, but now they'll be studied, and they'll be talked about, and they'll be remembered, and they'll be learned from. And that just touches my heart. I, I can't even tell you how elated I am 
how well this is all going and and, and it's a release it's uh, it's very important Laura thank you for that for that comment I appreciate that thanks Henry we do have a couple of questions um I'm gonna uh, Joe Feynman I think you had a question um, all the way from New York <laughs> so I'm gonna unmute you where's Joe I don't see him You'll still have to, to, to agree to unmute yourself. There we there go. There we go. There we go. You know, Hi, Jim. right from the beginning, all I could think about is the thousands of years of oppression that the Jewish, Jewish people have gone through. And right. this is just a constant reminder as you read this book that what you've written is the equivalent of 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 books that were not written since yeah. the Jewish people began. So yeah. it reminds you constantly that it is a, a book for today, particularly yeah. when you consider all of the abuse and the terrible events that have gone, have been going uh, recently with regard to Myanmar and Guatemala in the 50s and uh, Serbia. Uh, it's, and it's a constant reminder that this kind of abuse uh, certainly is something that this book reminds us of. And it's, it was just an incredibly emotional experience, not only hearing your story from you, but reading this book. And my wife, Sharon, just finished the book and she's oh. felt very much the same way. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joe. It's good to see you in New good York. To see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <clears throat> Um, we have a question in the chat. Susan Kahn asks about um, if you would speak a little bit to why you titled the book Torn Lilacs. Um, you know, that title came to me back in the 70s when I first started. It just came. I didn't know how it came. It just sounded good, Torn Lilacs. And the more I thought about it, maybe I should turn the question back to everybody there. What do you, what do you guys think about it? Does it mean anything? Howard, does that mean anything to you, Torn Lilacs? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> it's, uh, so it, it's, it's um, your father brings, brings your mother lilacs, right? When they're in, in Poland before the... Um... And, and, and my entire life, I, I, every March when the lilacs were in season and I knew where all the bushes were in Napa, I would go out at night, of course, with my scissors. And I would bring my mother big bunches of lilacs, which, you know, just... Uh, fragranced the whole house if there's such a word but uh that that smell evoked gustanine and it brought back all those memories the reason i use torn lilacs it's as if my parents are delicate flowers like like uh irises or lilac very delicate and they were uprooted they were torn viciously from their surroundings from their home and thrown to the winds like like torn lilacs, you know, you take it, it's almost an oxymoron or a juxtaposition of you've got lilacs, very delicate flowers, and you've got this aggressive torn, but they were uprooted like delicate flowers. And I think uh, it works for me. I hope it works for you too. And luckily, there's an explanation at the bottom. It says a true World War II story of love, defiance, and hope. And that's exactly what it was, defiance and hope. Thanks, the heroine. Henry. You're welcome. Thank you for asking that. Um, I'm wondering about what it was like for um, for your mother and father after experiencing all of the, the betrayals that they did um, in Europe, what it was like for them to, to move to a new country and interact with people outside of their family. And if, um, if you think that, that that affected sort of their attitudes towards um, towards non-Jews or the messaging that you got about um, folks and, and, and trust as you were growing up? Um, you know, I talked about the Fillmore District. They were, uh, they were, they surrounded themselves with like-minded people, fellow survivors. They felt comfort in that community. Uh, we joined the synagogue, of course. All three of us boys were bar mitzvah and we were raised in the Jewish tradition, those values. 
but we were keenly aware of anti-Semitism. Uh, of course, in the 50s, it was very much, it was around everywhere. Personally, um, I never really took it seriously. I, I, when I was called a dirty Jew, for example, or beaten, or beaten up regularly because we killed Jesus, um, I just felt bad for those people. I felt that they were actually victims themselves of a bad education because they had no idea what a Jew was. They certainly didn't know me or who I was. I was just, you know, a Jew and Jews killed Jesus. So they had to beat me up, but I didn't take it seriously because I knew they weren't bad people. They were, they were victims also of a society that allowed that to happen. And uh, we just moved on, you know, and I tried to educate people. I laughed at it, but I was not the kind that fought back and got angry every time somebody called me a dirty Jew. It just wasn't worth it. I'd be fighting my entire life. You know, and like my father, you just get on with your life. And the best thing you can do is smile and be prosperous and have a good life. That's the best anecdote against all the haters out there is just enjoy your life, live well, and uh, live a life of uh, tikkun olam. You know, giving back something too. That's very refreshing and rewarding. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Uh, okay, we have a more in the book or we can have questions or can go to sleep. What do, you, what do you want to do? We have we have one question about um, your teaching career and um, and also someone who would like to make a, to um, to make a comment. Um, okay. So the question about what what um what subject in high school did you know what what subject matter did you teach um in napa and um and during what period right uh i was a social studies teacher social sciences which means u.s history world history economics government uh criminal justice i taught all those classes primarily i was a history teacher and government for the seniors i had the honor seniors classes at napa high school and uh, I couldn't wait to get to work every morning. I only had a five minute commute down Jefferson, but I couldn't wait to see all my best friends every morning. And they were paying me every month. I couldn't believe it. We were having such a good time. <laughs> I really enjoyed teaching. I felt it was an honor that parents uh, bestowed their most precious possession to my care for an hour every day. I mean, how heady is that? Uh, and I, I felt the responsibility of the job and I, we started right on time every day, and the kids got their money's worth. I enjoy teaching very much. And someone else would like to know how your your students reacted when you would tell them the stories about your um, about your parents. Yeah, I mentioned before uh, I took a day out of the curriculum and I told this story. It took a, the entire period. You could hear a pin drop, and the kids were weeping. I mean, it was really amazing. And they would come up to the desk afterwards. And they would say, Mr. Mikulski, you know, it sounds like a movie, like a film. You've got to write this book. And I would go, yeah, yeah, I'm writing. I'm working on it. And every year, have you written a book yet? You know? uh, and, you know, life gets in the way and, you, and things happen and the years pass. And I, every time I was having fun on a vacation, I heard my mother's voice in the back of my head saying, Henry, you should write the book. Why are you having fun with your stamp collection? No one cares about your stamps. Write the book. <laughs> So I had that guilt uh, for years because I knew this book had to come out. And finally, uh, 2019, I said to myself, this is the year I'm going to dedicate myself once and for all. I'm going to do it. I got an editor, Jay Getting. We sat down a few times. We, we did it. And uh, my biggest regret, I have to say, is that my mother didn't live to see it. She died uh, 2019, February, uh, two years ago now, uh, at the age of 99. And I remember just before, about five years before she died, she and my brother came to me and said, Henry, where's the book? <laughs> We're waiting for the book. <laughs> and, uh, and I feel bad about that, that she's not here. But I'm hoping she's somewhere. Maybe she's listening now. I don't know. But at least it's, it's out, and it's brought honor and dignity to her life. And that's what's important. Yeah. Um, maybe we can, we'll, we'll take one more question um and the person who would like to make a comment why don't we take that now um let's keep it brief sure very brief uh 
Henry, I just wanted to thank you for putting into words, into text, uh, something that many of us, our, our parents went through, not in, uh, thankfully in my case, not in quite as extreme a situation. And the book just captures um, that history so eloquently. So thank you. Howard Erlanger, I didn't know you're here with us. Wonderful. I'm here. Good, good to see you. Howard was our class valedictorian at Washington High School. All right. Nice to see you, Howie. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, and um, about your students, some, someone asked, like, how, you know, how aware do you think they were? What understanding did they have of, of the anti Semitism um, and racism? And how did you, you know, um, how were those things discussed in your classroom? I, I, we really didn't discuss anti-Semitism that much. Um, of course, you know, when we studied World War II, the students always asked, why the Jews? Why did this happen? And I always had two answers for them. One was very long, it would take months. And one is very short, it's only one word. And you all know what it is, don't you? Jealousy. So, but that question would come up, you know, why did you, the, the kids were puzzled, you know, why was there so much hatred for these people? And like someone said earlier, it didn't just happen in the Holocaust. Yeah, it goes back 2000 years. It's the oldest hatred. It's, you know, pogroms and inquisitions and oh, it, it never ends. And to this day, still, it's palpable. You can still taste it. Uh, and there's just no excuse for it. We just need to keep telling the story. We need to educate people. And we need to continue doing good works. And um, and when the anti-Semites come out, we have to educate them, not laugh at them or beat them up, but try to figure out why they are this way. Because they're victims too, as far as I can see. It's just like those people that stormed the Capitol the other day. You know, they need to be educated. Thank you, Henry. Um, is there a passage that you'd like to end on? Actually, there is. It's very short, and it's more uplifting. It's not as harrowing as the others. It's a short piece that I would like to read. It's my father this time, and this takes place in, Gust in, um, in, Ka in Kazakhstan. I'm not born yet. My brother Jerry is born, okay? Let me just get my glasses here. Can you take one more? I hope Absolutely. I have right. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I'm going to read you one more section. This is towards the end of the book. Uh, my mother is very, very sick, and my brother Jerry is very sick. They're both going to die, okay? I'll just say that. And it's in the middle of a chapter, but you'll pick up on it. One day after work, Yoska, my father, hurriedly tied Yurik to his chest and carried him and a bucket of fresh boiled water covered with rags the seven kilometers to the hospital to visit Fella. At the time, Yurik was also very sick with a high fever and terrible diarrhea. Yuska feared the child would, might die. Life for Yuska was at an absolute low point. He felt helpless to care for a sick wife and child, and he really did not think Fella would survive the second bout with the deadly disease of typhus. Laden by his heavy load, he slogged on towards his dying wife, refusing to lose hope and determined to do what he could to save his family. At the nadir of his life, he looked up to the sky and pleaded with the only one. I ask you, dear God, not for a lighter burden, but for broader shoulders. Then about five kilometers into the trek, as he was struggling along the dusty dirt road, fatigued and despondent, toting the baby and the heavy water, something utterly amazing happened. It was as if God had heard his plea. A military supply truck overloaded with huge sacks of flour was passing by at a rapid speed. The vehicle hit a bump in the road, and one of those enormous sacks, weighing about 30 kilos, dislodged and fell to the ground where Yusko was walking. The truck continued on. Clutching little Yurik to his heart, Yusko raced towards the prize, pouncing on the sack of flour as if it were a chest of hidden treasure. He could not believe his luck. 
He thought for a moment of his ancestors wandering in the desert, whom God had provided with manna from heaven in their most desperate hour. For a brief euphoric moment, he would not have traded places with the American millionaire, John D. Rockefeller. Within a minute, another man, a wounded soldier with a limp and holding a cane, rushed over and claimed the sack was his, saying that he had seen it first. Fortunately, he and Yoska quickly agreed to divide the flour 50-50. God only knows there was enough of it to feed an entire village. But in minutes, another man came along and claimed a stake in the prize, elbowing his way to the spoils, and two others arrived on his heels until five men were arguing over how to split the flour. Yoska shouted to be heard, listen, fellows, let's drag the sack off the road. We'll pull it into a ditch out of the traffic and divide the sack among ourselves. No more partners. The men shouted in agreement. There's enough for everyone. Be quick or we'll have a thousand partners, one man at a time. The men did as Yoska suggested, each feeling like the luckiest person alive. Working with deliberate speed, each man scooped his portion into whatever he could carry, a can or a box. One man wrapped his portion in a shirt. Yoska made sure each man took an equal portion, then kept what was left in the sack for himself and hurried along with his treasure. Yoska's spirits were considerably lifted by the incredible find making the last two kilometers to the hospital seem easier and more hopeful. Suddenly feeling like a rich man with options, his mind was reeling with all the things he would make with the precious flower, the staff of life. He envisioned baking loaves of fresh bread, luxion, noodles, dumplings, and bilkas. All their friends in the area would share their happiness, but the largest and best portion would be meted out to his dear wife, Fella. And then it goes on. He visits her, and eventually he brings her back to health. And, of course, he attributes that to the flower that he found. He got Fella back to health, and he was able to save his son, Yurik. And uh, that's just another scene in the life, just, a, just another, uh, another incident. I clearly remember my father telling me that story how happy he was when he found that sack. And he said, he used the words, John D. Rockefeller. He says he felt like Rockefeller <laughs> when he found that. And that saved the family. Thank you, Henry. It's really remarkable. Um, we, ha we have a last um, classic closing question from uh, Laura Paul, which is, um, do you have any, um, do you have any other stories in you? Do I have any? <laughs> my kids badger me every day to write this, my own story, not just on the boat coming to America, but how we assimilated and, you know, as Americans, how we grew up in San Francisco. And I've already uh, outlined the chapters of the, of the uh, sequel. It's going to be uh, called Lilacs by the Bay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. We'll see. It's got a good title, don't you think? Lilacs by the way. But I want to tell the story how we assimilated, and I'm going to tell it in the first person from my point of view, and I've got a lot of really good stories to tell. And now that this book is doing so well, I think I will write this book. I wanted to see how Torn Lilacs would do first. Thank you, Henry. Um, if we don't have any other burning questions, oh, Max, do you have a question? Max? Uh, many of us have likely had the great opportunity to have heard Henry in many instances, but I want to address in particular the brilliant addition you were to our Mignon in Napa. A rudite doesn't come close to describing it. So my question to you is, in forming these beautiful droshes, were you able to just stay within the Rashi and stay within the learned text? Or were you reflecting back 
to the troubles within this drush, which has a lot of horrible stories throughout the Safer, and in relation to your own experience. Yeah. Well, we're all a combination of our life's experiences, you know, our parenting, the schools we go to, the friends we hang out with. That determines who you become as a person. Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, you want to put it in a more succinct way because that's that's all, all I can right. say. <clears throat> as far as the drug, you no, know, I, I love I, the research, Max. I, I love doing the research. And of course, you look at Rashi and you look at the other interpreters, but you bring your own experiences into it also and your life experiences and some of the current events in the news and you try to apply that. I did that as a teacher as well. If you take a historic moment and make it relevant to a child's understanding with contemporary issues, then it becomes alive to them and meaningful. And it's the same with the drush. You don't just go to the old text, but you bring in contemporary ideas as well. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Call Thank call. you, everyone, for joining us. Have a it's good great night. Really great we hope see. you'll purchase a copy of the book, um, and we'll send out some resources tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Thank you all very much for being with me tonight. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Is that Miles? Is that Miles Cortman? <laughs>